coming up on Carolina Week. People walk in and out of dorms all day long, but things are changing after a student was robbed at gunpoint. This scary incident has people more cautious. And the water crisis continues. The university is doing its part to save as much water as possible, but the efforts come at a hefty price. We'll show how much the university is dishing out. Plus, it's a no-go on a statewide lottery. You'll have to cross the border to play, and students might be forced to pay more to make up for the lost revenue. Those stories and lots more, Carolina Week starts now. From the School of Journalism and Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, this is Carolina Week. I'm Jenny McClendon. And I'm Alex Lawson. Thanks for joining us for the September 25th edition of Carolina Week. Campus police are now saying the two men who robbed a Carolina student at Avery Residence Hall may have also committed a burglary that day at Granville Towers. Carolina Week was the first on the scene at Avery along with campus police who responded to the, to the student's call for help in 60 seconds. The bandit robbed the student at gunpoint and took a laptop, jewelry, and some cash. Tuesday afternoon, public safety released surveillance pictures from Granville Towers of these two men wanted in connection with the Avery crime. Police say one thing that helped them connect the crimes was that the robbers took similar items in both incidents. If you recognize either man or have any information, please call public safety at 962-8100 or Carborough Chapel Hill Crime Stoppers at 942-7515. Campus police say this is the first armed robbery they can remember. Carolina Week's Aaron Duplois investigates how something like this could happen on our campus and what we can do about it. It's pretty easy to get into Carolina dorms. All you need is someone with a key to hold the door for you. And that's exactly what campus police say probably happened last Thursday. But a gun in a dorm? I've been working here since 93 and know that it has not happened in that time period and my understanding is it's never happened uh, at the university. Campus police were at the scene in 60 seconds and Chancellor James Mieser reacted with similar speed, sending out a campus-wide email the next day urging students to take safety seriously. Sophomore Will Miller says he's been more cautious since Thursday. It makes you more aware not only of your own security but also following the rules and sort of trying to make sure that you're not doing things out of the ordinary also. Sophomore Arjun Guerra used to just walk in when he visited friends in Avery. Now he calls from outside, even when residents offer to hold the door. People might look at me suspiciously in Avery if I just walk in behind someone else. At some schools, like the University of South Carolina, every visitor has to sign in before entering a dorm. But Assistant Housing Director Rick Bradley says there are no plans to change dorm security procedures here. Probably different from those schools is that we have a uh, fairly comprehensive door locking entry system that we use a, a Marlock key entrance. For now, the housing staff is urging students to keep in mind three key points at which they can improve their safety. Housing officials say there are three main safety points, and the first is the front door. Now the second point is the door going into your suite. And the final safety point is the door into your room. Being aware of your surroundings is always part of staying safe. In Chapel Hill, I'm Erin Dupois, Carolina Week. Campus police urge students to be aware of any people they don't recognize hanging around their dorms. Don't hesitate to call the police if you feel uncomfortable. A recent teach-in on campus isn't likely to attract national headlines like a couple of teach-ins did after 9-11. But this one was also about a possible war against Iraq. About 300 students in Triangle residents packed a Manning Hall classroom to hear a panel of speakers. The panelists took a strong anti-war stance, and that upset some representatives of, of the UNC College Republicans. The debate was at times both heated and lighthearted, but the small group workshops afterward provided a healthy discussion between opposing sides. The teach-in comes in a response to a lack of worldwide support for action to force a regime change in Iraq, something the UN U.S. insists must happen. As students continue to learn about Islamic issues, a new website is adding Carolina to its watch list. The site, campuswatch.org, was created by a pro-Israel think tank called Middle East Forum. 
The group examines the way professors teach about the Middle East on campuses across the country. Forum director Daniel Pipes first criticized UNC Chapel Hill because of its summer reading selection approaching the Quran. Now, Pipes is keeping tabs on how Carolina handles Middle East issues and is putting updates online. Other schools on the site's watch list include Harvard, Stanford, and NYU. For a link to that list, you can log on to our website at www.carolinaweek.org. The drought is the worst on record, and residents in Chapel Hill and Carbo are now facing emergency water restrictions. Ashley Kendrick tells us how the drought is hurting the university and what may be in store for us in the future months. There's no relief in sight for the drought. So the university is going to have to deal with these restrictions for a while. The most important thing to think about is that the lake level is very, very low. UNC wants to reduce water use by 25 percent, and without substantial rain, we could run out of water by next summer. Even with a 50 percent reduction, we could still run out of water by next fall. Lots of people are trying to help the university meet this goal. Housing is trying to increase awareness. Well, we've already put up signs and flyers. Uh, that is, was the first approach. Some efforts come with a high price. Styrofoam cost us about a quarter million dollars. Um, if we went to recycle paper product, it would pr be closer to a million dollars. Good news is the styrofoam is being recycled at Chase. Bad news is it's not being done at Lenore. Lenore Hall is we do not have as much space. The dish room is half the size. The loading dock area really has no place to put these pallets that have to be picked up. Other measures could affect the overall look of the campus. Under emergency restrictions, no new plants will be put in the ground because they can't be watered. Even Keenan Stadium is having water imported for the upkeep of the field. It's a pretty bleak picture that, that, uh, that I would paint to, the, to everybody, not just the students, but everybody in the university community. No one knows what the next step will be in conservation measures. But the bottom line is, uh, we all need to do our part. Every individual needs to do something to save water. In Chapel Hill, I'm Ashley Kendrick, Carolina Week. To find out the latest information concerning the drought, click on our website at carolinaweek.org. Last week, we reported that chemistry professor Joseph D. Simone has decided to remain at Carolina. And in that report, we incorrectly stated that university officials raised D. Simone's nine-month salary from $27,000 to $150,000. The professor's salary was actually raised by $27,000. We apologize for the error. A proposed town ordinance could deal a blow to Carolina students looking for off-campus housing. If adopted, the ordinance would allow no more than two unrelated people and two cars per duplex and would ban future duplex construction. Town Council members think these measures would solve the traffic and trash problems caused by the overcrowding of students into duplexes. But Interim Vice Chan Chancellor for Student Affairs Dean Bresciani says the ordinance would create more problems by decreasing the supply of housing while increasing the demand. For a renter that means that our already high rental rates increase fairly substantially or their option if they can't afford those rates are to live somewhere uh, on the extremities of the town. Gresciani says this would take money away from local businesses and bring more traffic into Chapel Hill. GHB, it's on campus and it can cause a lot of problems. And everywhere you look, people are talking on cell phones. What are you supposed to do with them when your contract runs out? Find out when Carolina Week returns, but first, let's go to Kelly Mahoney for the latest about three tropical storms. And Isidore are all looming in our forecast. I'll tell you where they're headed and what you can expect when Carolina Week continues. Uno de estos niños tiene problemas aprendiendo las letras. Una de ellas tiene problemas aprendiendo a leer. ¿Sabe usted cuáles? Aunque parecen iguales, algunos tienen problemas de aprendizaje. Si usted sospecha que su hijo es uno de ellos, Hable ahora con su maestro, incluso si piensa que su problema está relacionado con el inglés. Llámenos ahora o visite nuestra página de internet. Los niños con problemas de aprendizaje también pueden aprender. The steps of Wilson Library received no sunshine on early winter mornings, so it's chilly there. If you don't have that double shot caramel espresso, 
surrounded by forever green magnolias. The steps are a fine place to study, or at least pretend to, while you watch a border collie chase a frisbee in the quad. No one knows the real Carolina like a student. Carolina Week, the student news show. On November 5th, voters won't get the chance to vote on a lottery. The North Carolina House voted last week not to put the issue on the ballot. Carolina Week's Michael Handy tells us how this decision could affect UNC Chapel Hill. North Carolinians won't see lottery tickets popping out of machines anytime soon, and they won't get the chance to scratch any tickets either. North Carolina State Senator Howard Lee explains. Unfortunately, there are too many legislators who are so strongly opposed to a lottery that the House cannot vote it out uh, in, even in the form of a referendum. Senator Lee says North Carolina is losing millions of dollars each year as people cross the border to buy their lotto tickets. The effect on the state's education system will even be felt at Carolina. I think it's unfortunate that we've had such a strong opposition to it because a lottery could mean a great deal to the state in the way of educational funding. I'm concerned more that the universities themselves and especially UNC Chapel Hill, may decide to move more toward increasing fees. Senior Davin Patel is against any increase in tuition or fees. The tuition increase is definitely not a good thing, especially because there's a lot of aid that needs to go out for students who don't have enough money to come here. And I think the lottery would actually benefit like state schools, public schools, uh, the extra source of revenue they can give back. But it seems that extra source of revenue won't come any time in the near future. Senator Lee thinks North Carolina might never see a lottery. In Chapel Hill, I'm Michael Handy, Carolina Week. Legislators give various reasons for their opposition. Some are morally opposed, while others feel a lottery would target the poor. A nationwide debate about the drug gamma-hydroxybutyrate, or GHB, is now raging on campus. The same student who was hospitalized last week because of the drug was brought up on possession charges earlier this week. Here's some important information about GHB. GHB can cause seizures, vomiting, and convulsions. It can also slow down breathing to six or fewer breaths per second. These effects can all lead to death. Authorities say this is the first GHB case on campus in almost 10 years, and they believe it's an isolated incident. If you hadn't noticed, the use of cell phones is on the rise, and that has environmentalists concerned. According to a recent study, by the year 2005, people in the U.S. will throw away 130 million cell phones each year. Environmentalists are concerned Americans are unaware of how to properly dispose of one. Wake and Durham counties already have electronic recycling facilities in place. Orange County will open its facility in February. But until then, recycling manager Bill Pollack says there are other options. If you have a cell phone that's not working or that you just, you're not going to deal with Durham or what have you, at least take the battery out and, and recycle that in, at one of the solid waste convenience centers in Orange County. If you have a cell phone battery to recycle, you can take it to one of the following collection centers in Orange County. One is located on Highway 57, just north of Highway 86. You can also find other collection centers located at Bradshaw Quarry Road, Eubanks Road, Ferguson Road, High Rock Road, and Walnut Creek Church Road. In this week's Speak Out segment, we asked students, what are you going to do with your old cell phone when it's time for a new one? Well, when I got my new cell phone, I gave my old one to my mom, so I just passed it down to the family. I'd probably give it away. Probably turn it into our phone company as a down, like down payment or something for the other one. I heard that you can donate them to, like, homeless shelter or battered women's shelters, things like that, because I guess they all have to be programmed to dial 911. So I'll probably donate it to a shelter. Throw it away. Probably just pass it along to someone else in my family when I get a different plan or whatever. Our sample isn't scientific and shouldn't be taken as a reflection of widespread opinion on campus. One of Franklin, Franklin Street's staples is open for business again. Three months after a kitchen fire forced the owners to close hams, the restaurant is fully renovated and ready for big game days. Changes to the restaurant include a brand new bar, more TVs, and a mural commem commemorating the Tar Heels national championship teams. In addition to the inside and outside of the building, the menu also underwent some changes. With new food and a new, and a new look, management hopes to add a new family appeal while maintaining the old college atmosphere. 
Although crowds have been light so far, the owner expects businesses to pick up very quickly. And now Kelly Mahoney joins us with weather. Kelly, I hear we got a lot of tropical systems out there. We Does that affect us at all? Yeah, we really do. It's the peak of hurricane season and the tropics are really active. And we'll get into how that might play into our weekend forecast in just a second. But first, let's go to this week's ever timely weather question. And it is, what can steer hurricanes toward the U.S. shore? Is it the Alberta Clipper, the Bermuda High, the Caribbean Low, or Hurricane Hunters? I'll have the answer to that weather question and your weekend forecast when Carolina Week returns. Escucha Smokey antes de tratar. Solo tú. No juegues con fósforos, no juegues con fuego. Fuego. No hay nada perturbador con el más asustado a un pobre ratón sin casa en que vivir. Sin hermoso bosque, que es lo que deseas. No juegues con fósforos, no juegues con fuego. Solo tú puedes prevenir los fuegos forestales. Fuego. Making a can from recycled aluminum instead of from raw materials reduces air pollution by 95%. Recycle, it's the everyday way to save the world. Recycling all our Sunday papers would save over half a million trees a week. Recycle, it's the everyday way to save the world. Recycling a glass bottle saves enough energy to run the TV you're watching for one full hour. Recycle, it's the everyday way to save the world. Hi, and welcome back to Carolina Week, and welcome to the first week of fall. Temperatures in the 70s and pretty clear conditions are really a good introduction to this, our next season, and it won't be long, though, until temperatures start to cool off. These acorns here start to fall, and the leaves start to change colors. Now, luckily, we have a little bit of time before that starts, but it'll be here before you know it. But we are still in hurricane season, and we want to go to that and explain a little bit about what's going on in the tropics right now. Let's start with Tropical Storm Kyle. This guy's been sitting out in the Atlantic for about a week now, slowly intensifying, and he's forecasted to become a hurricane within the next couple of days. Luckily, you can see he's quite a ways from the North Carolina shore and the mainland of the U.S. So we think we're safe there. But if we head on and look at Tropical Storm Lily, this is a storm that was born down here in the warm waters of the Caribbean, and she has since started making a northward track. Now, by Saturday morning, she's forecasted to be uh, just over Cuba and starting to pick up some speed and possibly some intensity. So, especially those of us uh, living in Florida or with relatives there, you're going to want to keep tuned to that forecast because one way or another, Lily's going to have some impact on U.S. weather, and it could even impact us up here in North Carolina. Now, of course, what everyone's been talking about this week is Tropical Storm Isidore. He, uh, he's headed right for New Orleans as we speak, and if you take a look at the projected path, North Carolina will be affected by this storm, and we'll see that in our forecast coming up in just a minute. But you can see landfall is expected as we head into the weekend, and then a, a upper level system is going to pick Isidore up and just carry it very quickly off to the north. So this should be a short-lived storm, at least, you know, lasting for at least a couple more days, but it'll be out of our hair soon enough. Well, let's take a look at the satellite map and see what's going on in the rest of the U.S. You can see Isidore located down here to the south, and out to the west, you can see a small band of clouds. Now, that band of clouds is indicative of a cold front that's really going to be the major player in our forecast coming up this week. It's going to lift the uh, band of clouds associated with Isidore up to the north and going to present us with a chance for some rain showers and even some thunder showers as we head into the earlier part of the weekend. You can see that very easily on the uh, forecast map. If we take a look at that, here is Isidore just making landfall as we head into Friday morning. But like I said, she, uh, he is going to get picked up very quickly and start making it up the eastern seaboard, presenting us in North Carolina with a chance of rain, both tropical rain from Isidore and some cold frontal rain, which could give us a couple thunderstorms. So if you have outdoor plans on Friday, you're going to want to stay tuned to the uh, cha ever-changing forecast at this time of the year with all these tropical systems. Here's your Friday forecast. I have showers on here, but keep an eye out for that uh, isolated thunder shower. A tropical high of 82 degrees is going to start drying out as we head into the weekend with partly cloudy skies skies on Saturday and mostly sunny skies on Sunday and Monday with seasonable temperatures in the upper 70s. If you're headed down to the beach, Saturday once again the chance for an isolated prefrontal shower, excuse me, a high of 85 degrees on Sunday will clear things out a little bit at a high of just 82 degrees. If you're headed out to the mountains, like I said, the western part of the state really going to be impacted by Isidore. Rain
rain and uh, thunder showers on Saturday with a high of 72. Partly cloudy skies on Sunday, really shaping up to be a nice fall day though with a high of 68 degrees. And the game day forecast for Saturday checks at about 3.30, so we're going to go with 77 degrees under, we'll say, variably cloudy skies. So things look to be shaping up just about okay for Saturday for the game. And anyone want to guess on what one of those steering mechanisms of a hurricane could possibly be? I think I'll try A, Alberta Clipper. Actually, it's some cold weather stuff, but the Bermuda High actually starts to help steer some systems toward the U.S. coast, so we'll want to watch that over the next couple of days. All right. Thanks a lot, Kelly. Thanks, Kelly. Sure. Brad Broders joins us now with a look at sports. Yes, we got a lot of great things to talk about, and at, coming up after the break, we'll talk to one Carolina athlete who leads a double life, and the proof is on her shoe. Carolina Week Sports is next. What's wrong, Mrs. Jenkins? Hmm. Come on, you can tell me. Well, there's no funding for the new reading program, and I've tried everything and nothing works. It's not fair. Nobody ever gives me funding. When adults run out of ideas, they can feel as frustrated as kids. ConnectForKids.org has thousands of resources for helping kids in your community. Mrs. Jenkins, holding your breath is not going to get you any more funding. ConnectForKids.org, guidance for grown-ups. Did you know that 1,600 children are infected with HIV worldwide every day? The mission of the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation is to give children a future of hope. The foundation funds pediatric research to ensure that children are at the forefront of every scientific breakthrough. Every child deserves the chance to live a healthy life. Help give a child that chance. Support the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation. Welcome back to Carolina Week Sports. This Saturday, the Carolina football team faces its first ACC competition of the season in the form of Georgia Tech. The Heels haven't beaten Tech since 1997. Quarterback Darian Duran and the Heels had an extra week to prepare for the rambling wreck. And Dave Huxable's defense is the focus. The Heels say that if they hit their opponents hard and stuff the ground attack this weekend, Tech won't escape with Chapel Hill with a win. The players also say they are ready to make a statement to anyone doubting them in the ACC. We've been really putting emphasis on stopping the run, listening to coaches and really just focusing on that, doing drills all week and practice, just trying to stop the run because that's our, you know, we got that, we got really strong secondary, they're all experienced, so if we can stop the run, make them throw and get a pass rush, then, you know, we're going to stop most people. We're excited about this ACC game and that's a game to make a statement for us, you know, Going into this game is going to tell a lot about us going through the ACC and try to make a statement for the people that are still doubting us. Well, football's on the minds of many sports fans right now, but Carolina baseball coach Mike Fox is already thinking about his team's upcoming season. Although his first game is more than five months away, players are already running full speed ahead. The team scrimmaged Saturday, giving players a chance to make mistakes and to learn Fox's system. The team worked on pitching, hitting, and base running fundamentals. Fox says fall workouts are a great way for him to evaluate and teach his young players and also a way to get them in shape for the season. Several young players will need to step up to the plate this year because Carolina lost four starters in last year's draft. But when they say athletes pull double duty, it usually refers to another position or maybe even another sport. But Carolina Week Steve Lyerly tells us about one female Tar Heel who really cooks up a storm. This is a story of one special athlete, Carolina sophomore Lori Garrity. Uh, she's a very unique person, that's for sure. No, this New Hampshire native doesn't dribble a basketball or even hit a softball. Instead, she throws a little ball, a really heavy little ball. I do shot, the discus, and the hammer. She has some, some gifts. That she's got some God-given gifts. And those gifts shine, considering she's been throwing for only three years. But that didn't stop her from setting a national high school record by throwing the shot put 53 feet, 11 inches. I had the base from gymnastics, which helped a lot. I mean, it's not like most athletes that just walk into a sport cold. She has a lot of, a lot of special abilities. Those abilities, however, aren't limited to throwing. This woman also bakes desserts. As a freshman, Laura decided the food at Lenore wasn't tip top, but she didn't know how to cook. So she decided to employ the old saying, if you can't beat them, you might as well join them. She kept telling me how she couldn't cook, so I said, well, 
And what are you doing in the cafeteria? And they had to take me from, you know, I burn water when I boil it, to teaching me how to like bake and decorate cakes. But pastry chef Katrina Bean thinks the shot put champion has a natural knack for cooking. She's fabulous. Oh, she can do anything in here. It's wonderful. Makes me look bad. I've made enough Rice Krispie treats to, to choke a horse. So she's one heck of a cook, throws the shot and the hammer. But honestly, how heavy can this little ball be? Pretty heavy. But it seems she handles it just fine, just like everything else she does. Her constant drive to become the best she can be is, is second to none. And her peers believe that attitude will be her recipe for success in the future. In Chapel Hill, Steve Lyerly, Carolina Week. Now, Garrett injured her knee during indoor track last season, but she's confident that her training over this past offseason will help her in winning the ACC as a redshirt freshman. Well, two Carolina teams travel to play in-state opponents Tuesday night. The men's soccer team scored a 7-1 victory against Campbell. The Heels scored four goals in the first 12 minutes of the game to take Campbell out of it early. Each of Carolina's three forwards had two goals in the win. And after receiving the program's highest ranking ever on Monday, the 15th ranked volleyball team kept on winning against Charlotte. Charlotte gave the Heels a fight, taking the first game against Carolina since 1993. But the Heels would be too strong as they would finish off the 49ers in four games. Senior Malika Underwood had 18 digs and Senior Laura Green added 17 kills and 11 digs in the win. Now guys, the highest level for an ACC team is 13th ever, so Carolina will have to see if we can get that in the coming weeks. Yeah, well, I'm looking forward to Saturday. You know, football is my favorite sport. It's so ACC, it's, it's ACC time. This should be a great time. Okay, thanks a lot, Brad. No problem. And Brad Broder's favorite drink is? Beer. <laughs> well, Broder's would have been in hog heaven this weekend in Durham. Find out what we're talking about when Carolina Week returns. <laughs> One out of 20 people in the United States has been infected with hepatitis B. Two billion people in the world have had hepatitis B in their lifetime. 80% of newborns that are infected with hepatitis B are likely to have it for life. More people are infected with hepatitis B than HIV. Many people have it and don't know it. There is no cure yet, but it is preventable, and there is support and treatment. For more information, visit our webpage or email us at info at hepb.org. If you have a story idea, contact Carolina Week at 843-8292. You can also visit us online at carolinaweek.org. If you have questions about this program, write Carolina Week at Campus Box 3365, UNCCH, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, 27599. Did someone say beer? That was the word in Durham Saturday. Beer lovers from the Triangle and beyond flocked to the historic Durham Athletic Park throughout the day to wet their whistles. The seventh annual World Beer Festival featured more than 300 selections from 100 breweries around the world, including Franklin Street's Top of the Hill and Carolina Brewery. Festival goers enjoyed the weather and music from bands while throwing down one of their favorite beverages. The event benefited the Carolina Theater, a 1920s performance hall, and the last of the original theaters in Durham. Some unusual faces are hanging around the North Carolina Botanical Gardens in Chapel Hill. They're part of a newly opened art exhibit. The 15th annual Sculpture in the Garden show opened last week. The exhibit features 70 pieces of art placed among the garden's permanent plant collections. The works vary widely in style and price. Visitors can buy the sculptures for prices ranging from less than 200 bucks to several thousand dollars. The exhibit is open daily until November 22nd. That does it for this edition of Carolina Week. For Alex Lawson, Kelly Mahoney, Brad Broders, and the entire Carolina Week news team, I'm Jenny McClendon. Have a good night. Good night. We'll see you next week.